I think that within Heritage Orchestra there's probably some players that have a very, very broad understanding. They would have picked up a string instrument at the age of three and really learnt the roots of the classical tree. And at the same time they would have also have been listening to Radio 1 on the way to school in the morning. It's always a misconception to think that orchestral players only listen to Mozart. <laughs> Over the years sort of leading up to 2015, I'd been lucky enough to do a couple of great projects as part of the BBC Proms Festival. And the chief of the Proms gave me a call one day and said, hey, you know, we've been talking to Radio One, we've got this idea, and do you think this is, this is possible? So my collaboration with the Heritage Orchestra came about as a bit of a blind date at the beginning. Um, it was January 2015, and I got a call from Radio One to ask whether I would like to curate one of the proms that summer. I said that sounds like a very interesting proposition. Yes, but how do I do it? I've never done anything like that before. I think Pete had the same concerns that I did and that Chris did, and that was kind of like, can we do this with a level of integrity that the audience will dig? From the opening parts of, of Right Here, Right Now, we knew that this was like a special gig. It had tapped into a, a moment and that was liftoff. The theme to the show was Ibiza. The, it happened to be the 20th anniversary of me taking Radio 1 down to Ibiza to do the annual broadcast and we wanted to spice up the kind of celebrations that year. So initially it was like a playlist of 70 tracks. I, I had this mad idea at one time to try and do all of them because we had 70 minutes to perform and, and Jules and Chris calmed me down and said that that's ridiculous. The track list is, is always exciting when it gets to that point of deciding which tracks are in, which tracks are out. There's always some that you think, oh, I wish we'd put this one in. I think our feeling was that it needed to be as slamming as possible, that the intent of the music needed to be very clear to the audience. Trying to compare playing with the Heritage Orchestra to my DJ set, it's like driving a commercial road sports car your whole life and then suddenly for the first time getting in a Formula One car. It doesn't run on normal roads. <laughs> it's you know, 65, 70 times more powerful. It's definitely um, not like a generic symphony orchestra, starting with our insane rhythm section and the music that we play is obviously it's not classical. Uh, it's sometimes we play things that are classically influenced, but not always. Um, the lineup, I would say most people that play in this band have um, interest in other music. So um, jazz, rock, pop, yeah, we're very different to a lot of orchestras. Getting these things together is quite a tricky process because they're, they're never written with musicians in mind. They're not written to be performed. So you'll have like quite a lot of layers of the drum parts and you really have to decide which bits are going to be in when you play it, which bits aren't going to be in. So you, you'll get the stems, you'll get the samples and then you have to put it into an instrument. You build the drum kits on that, you build the sample instruments and then after about three hours of silent nerding we start playing. Let's do Sing It Back straight through. Manchester, how are we feeling? Heritage Orchestra is not a conventional symphony orchestra, it has at its core a band essentially. Um, we've got Adam Betts on drums, we've got John Calvert on bass and synths, we've got Matt Calvert on guitar and synths and we've got Rob Gentry on all manner of different keyed instruments. When you are ready, I will be we sometimes work with a much more collaborative process where we'll get into the room with the guys in the core band. We might have some key material but we'll start to break that down and look at how we could make a more unique arrangement. Kind of reverse engineering starts by breaking down that drum beat, how are we going to get that? Do we need to split it between two drummers and a percussionist? Do we want to change the sound? One 
one of the major assets of the guys in the band is that they understand where these sounds come from, they understand synthesis. And they know how to find the right colour at high speed. Bets, looking back, what made you decide to go to the academy? Just play shit like this, really. Yeah. <laughs> it, it all makes sense. I didn't study classical music. No, I studied jazz on the, at the Royal Academy of Music. I mean, again, that's as funny as me studying classical. Like, well, they're like, okay, cool. So like, now we're going to do like a Benny Goodman thing. We opened with a Tristano project. So it was literally like... audiences have been amazing. It's always the kind of individual people that you can single out in the audience that are properly into it, like, you know, not, not just filming on their phone, but actually dancing like they're at a club in Avita. That's the kind of bit that excites me, just finding the one or two people on their own that are absolutely in their own world and just loving it and just playing for them for a bit. Doing this show with the Heritage Orchestra is it only really works at scale, so the kind of venues that we've been playing, I've never really got close to. I mean, occasionally I've done things at big arenas when you're on a kind of multi-DJ bill, but nothing on this scale, certainly. We formed the orchestra in 2004. It was uh, uh, Jules and I kind of put it together for a, for a club night that, that I was doing in Cargo in East London, and it was really, it was fun. It was about getting our mates together in a club and putting a ridiculously big group together. In the early days with Heritage Yorkshire, our goals were at the very beginning to put together this one concert at Cargo with absolutely no expectations. When we first started playing, we, we only had like table lamps gaffered taped to our, our music stands and we had, we had like four ways daisy chained across to like power a Fender amp. No one was mic'd up in our first gigs, it was just like, it was absolutely madness. I, I swear that there was probably music stuck on people's backs at a certain point. The, the sound from the tube, I remember, was, was hitting an air conditioning pipe. That whole sort of like white coat orchestra playing in a park with the people eating ice cream is something that we try to avoid and instead look to develop and push the future visions of what orchestras can do. Yeah, I really enjoy you know, reworking these classic tunes with the Heritage Orchestra and, and Jules. The, the process is always evolving because we came together to do a particular appointment. So the second time we really creatively got together, it was to make the album. Chris was very vocal about not wanting to just set up the orchestra and mic it up and record the set live. Again, this is one of, one of those ones where we didn't know how to gauge it, like the, the reinterpretive or just covering stuff or how far you go with each stuff. It ended up being just like supersizing some of these classic tracks. Basically, we just wanted to turn it into the biggest dance band in history. You know, like we just wanted to make it so slamming that the audience could not leave the room without having felt that that was an honorable representation of music that is so close to so many people. Our gig is entirely live, so it, it is changeable. So if anybody wants to play something for longer, that's cool, we all adjust. And yeah, Insomnia is definitely an adjustable track. I've always loved that track, it's one of the first tracks of its kind that I ever had on cassette tape, which I had to hide from my parents because they didn't want me to listen to it. Insomnia was the best one on it, and now I'm playing them and it's cool and I'm allowed. But it's physically hard. There's definitely two dropouts when it just goes to strings working really hard and you kind of feel it in your arms. I can't get no sleep.
Well, actually, you want to know two things? I'm, I think I'm going to do a stage dive. Nice. You, do you guys want to do a stage yeah. dive? Isn't there normally like about seven foot between the stage and the barriers and then the audience? Yeah, I, the I haven't figured that bit out yet. People think that we're a classical group because we're an orchestra. We've never really thought of ourselves as being classical. We've always played non-classical music. We like electronic music and world music and experimental music. So I think we just like to be relevant. And make some noise for my special guest tonight, Ray, joining us on stage. The second album I think was probably the most enjoyable part of the whole process so far because we were starting everything from scratch. We can throw shapes together, but it doesn't mean you're in my circle. Hey! With the second album, the choice of songs from Pete's original list, we had several offcuts from that of tunes we really loved, but they didn't quite work in the balance of that first show, which became the album. So with the second album, we had those offcuts, and then we brought in some tunes which were, were much, much more modern. See your Apple camera flashing. Please step back, it's my style, you're cramping. You hit for long, go, no, I'm just passing. Do you want a drink? Show me how! Whoa! Ray, thank you! Make some noise! Thank you so much, O2. Thank you, Peter. My feeling is that there's more depth in the second album. There's more light and dark. Basically, there's more shade. And I feel that translates also into this live show. The energy in the orchestra is completely dictated by the energy of the audience. In fact, this entire show is pretty much reliant on the audience and the orchestra just feed off of that. The cinemascope version of these tunes is just like, it's pretty crazy. And I think we were all like at school together and then we're all playing in front of 20,000 people. You do look around at your mates and think, what the, what the hell is going on here? been very privileged to have been lent the instrument I play on since I was 18 I think, 17, 18. And um, one time it got stolen from the band room at the academy where I studied and then I, it arrived a month later. And then the day it arrived back um, I went on a train and I left it on the train. <laughs> but um, I I've still got it and the people still trust me with it which is amazing. <laughs> When the opportunity came to do our own shows, I guess with Ibiza as the theme, it was trying to turn it into a kind of experiential, emotional evening. I love touring, especially with a band of best friends. And there's always tour blues afterwards when you get home, because obviously you miss everybody and you don't get that buzz from the big gigs. So yeah, I love it, it's brilliant. 